it's nine o'clock. Please start. Thank you, Karin. Welcome, everybody. My name is Nina Vogel, and I'm the acting program director of SRU Urban Futures. And today I act here as your host. Today's seminar or webinar actually is Climate Change Challenges and Ways Forward for Land Use is part of a seminar series called Climate Conversations. This seminar series is a collective effort of SLU Global supporting SLU's work for global development to contribute to the Agenda 2030 with a focus on low income countries and SLU's four research platforms, or so called future platforms SLU Future Food. Future Forest, Future One Health, and SLU Urban Futures, which are strategic units that foster transdisciplinary research, teaching, and collaboration. With this seminar series, we take the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, sixth assessment report, which was launched this year in 21 and also next year in 2022, as an opportunity to increase the scientific conversation about climate change across disciplines here at SLU, with a series of internal um, scientific dialogues, but also as well as open seminars, such as this webinar today, with both external and SLU participants. Currently, the physical science basis contribution of working group one is out, and that one will be also one of the core references for this webinar today. We will hear, hear more about it later from our first keynote speaker. Now I would like to come to introduce our moderator of today, Ingrid Oeborn. She is professor um, of agricultural cropping systems at the Department of Crop Production Ecology at SLU. She's also a senior research fellow of World Agroforestry in Nairobi, Kenya. Her research interest includes sustainable diversification and intensification of farming system worldwide and pathways and challenges towards the transformation of landscapes, livestock, and livelihoods in East Africa. So Ingrid will introduce us to our four keynote speakers shortly. Before that, I would like to highlight that we really welcome all your questions. So please write your questions in the Q&A sections at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions you're interested in, and we encourage you to, con uh, to continue certainly also after our discussion in the after mingle session. More, more information about it later on. So Ingrid, I hereby hand over to you. Thank you very much. And welcome everybody to this um, hopefully very interesting um, morning or afternoon and today's webinar. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our four speakers. So first out will be um, Marco Rumikainen who is a professor at the Department of Physical Geography and Ecosystem Science at Lund University in southern Sweden. And he is the Swedish focal point for the IPCC, which means that he's involved in the UN climate negotiations where he represents Sweden at the IPCC plenaries. Marco Rumikainen is professor in clima climatology and climate advisor at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute. He has long research experience in climate models and scenarios, and he was one of the lead authors of the IPCC's fifth assessment report in 2013. So you're very welcome, uh, Marco. The second speaker um, I'm very happy to introduce is Professor Dr. Salamul Hook from the Independent University, Bangladesh. Professor Hook is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development and an expert in adaptation to climate change in the most vulnerable developing countries. He has been a lead author of the third, fourth and fifth assessment reports of the IPCC and he advises the least developed countries group in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So you are really very welcome, um, Professor Hook. The third speaker is Professor Christina Bleno from the Department of Landscape Architecture, Planning and Management at SLU. Christina Bleno is Professor of Landscape Analysis and the Visiting Professor at Lund University, as well as then Professor at SLU. 
the current research interests are in risk analysis and science and proven experience. She studies the interplay between people and their environment, in particular in relation to climate change. She employs interdisciplinary strategies with empirical models and computer simulations, often in international collaboration and in close contacts with stakeholders. And finally, our fourth uh, presenter of today is Associate Professor Eric Carlton, who is a researcher at the Department of Soil and Environment at SLU. Eric Carlton is a member of the team at SLU, or in Sweden actually, that compiles the Swedish report, reporting of greenhouse gas emissions and uptake from land use, land use change and forestry. And they do this based on national environmental monitoring data. Eric Carlton's research focus is on forestry and agriculture as drivers of emission or uptake of greenhouse gases in Sweden, as well as in East and Southern Africa. And he is the Swedish focal point for the Global Soil Partnership. So all of you are really welcome um, to this webinar. And we're really looking forward to hear what you have to to say. So with that, I would like to give the, the word to the first speaker, to Professor Marco Rumekainen. So the, the floor is yours, Marco. Thank you, Ingrid. And um, good morning to all. I will say a few, few words about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to provide context to what I'm going to say about the latest report of the panel that came out 9th of August this year, after a few years of work by several hundreds of scientists. And then I will conclude with some thoughts uh, for the road ahead. Sharing the presentation. The IPCC has been around for more than 30 years and it's a United Nations body to assess science, which is related to and relevant to climate change. It's about natural sciences, but it's also about social sciences, sciences. it's about technical sciences, it's about um, all areas of science, it's about the climate system and about possible solutions to curbing climate change, both via mitigation and adaptation. The um, IPCC does not do research, as I'm sure most of you know. It bases its assessments on published research and other available knowledge, including the possible different views on a certain subject, levels of confidence, levels of certainty, and so forth. The IPCC assessments inform not least the United Nations climate negotiations, such as the upcoming event in Glasgow in November, but also policy at national levels, also climate ambition at the business and the private sector, public sector, and act action on, on, all, on all areas. It also provides a wealth of information for scientists who are working on some aspects on, on climate change. What is also important to know about the IPCC is that it doesn't say what should be done, but it does as a science that is relevant for discussing possible choices, possible solutions, possible ways forward. The present report from August is part of the sixth assessment cycle of the IPCC. The AR6, the sixth assessment cycle has already produced three special reports that came out 2018, 2019, including a special report on climate change and land. In the sixth assessment cycle, there has been also an update to the guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories about uptake and emissions from different sectors, including the land sector. The present report is about the climate system, natural sciences, about what happens in the climate system as we speak, trends in temperature, sea level rise, 
melting ice, uh, but also the carbon cycle, new set of climate models and climate projections on how the future may unfold, depending on how the emissions globally will unfold. And there will be two additional reports coming out in February and March next year, which are about climate impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, and mitigation of climate change, possible ways forward in terms of new technology, energy systems, um, managing land management, finance, and so forth. And there will be also a synthesis report that just puts together all the reports that include in the six or seven cycle. The present report has been uh, worked on by more than 200 lead authors who were assisted by additional 700 contributing authors, 500, sorry. It's based on 14,000 published research articles. And as there is a um, review cycle in the process, which means that additional external researchers and scientists, as well as others, can provide comments on successive drafts of the report. The authors have incorporated almost 80,000 comments on the report, which is reflected then in the final, final uh, report. So it's a uh, significant amount of work that has been put on the, on the assessment. Key findings, well, first of all, what we see in the climate system is about changes that are widespread, they are global in extent, they are rapid, some things are going faster now than just 10, 20 years ago, and they are intensifying. Many of the recent changes also are unprecedented in time perspectives going back hundreds of thousands to hundreds of thousands to in some cases, millions of years, which means that we are talking about unprecedented in the human perspective, however we defined it, define it. It is also an established fact, it's indisputable that human activities, it is the human activities that are causing climate change, what we see in terms of warming, sea level rise, melting ice and so forth. And this time compared to the assessment, the last assessment that came out 2013, the corresponding report is that now the climate change is also seen, not only potentially affecting climate extremes, but affecting climatic scenes, making them come more frequently and becoming more severe. Climate change is global, as mentioned. It's already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways, depending on where we are, depending on how vulnerable we are, depending what we are doing to adapt to climate change. And these, of course, we'll experience with all further warming, which means that all emissions all uptakes play a role, all continued change plays a role. What is needed to meet the global climate goals, which were decided in Paris 2015 within the UN climate negotiations is that is about immediate, rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, not least carbon dioxide, but also other greenhouse gas emissions coming from the use of fossil fuels and, and use change. Otherwise, the 1.5 degree goal is certainly beyond reach. And even the two degree goal also in the Paris Agreement becomes ever more unlikely to be met. Also, the, what we do with climate today, what we do with emissions means that we will have a climate change that will be around for a very long time. Things like sea level rise and melting ice sheets or parts of the ice sheets is not possible to stop. They will continue for hundreds of years, if not longer, even after the emissions have been reduced to net zero. And even if there are negative emissions to take away some carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the climate system change does not stop with the, with the global warming or or emissions. Of course, the emissions until net zero emissions or negative emissions do play a role how large the continued changes are. But the fact that these things will continue to change is not possible to stop. 
So some changes can be slowed down and others like the warming self can be stopped, can be stopped by, by reducing emissions to net zero or going negative. There's a deep uncertainty about the so-called tipping points. What will happen to sea current system, ocean circulation? What will happen with permafrost regions and carbon in the permafrost in, in the frozen, frozen earth? What will happen with large ecosystems like the Amazonian rainforests? What will happen to a number of other things, the monsoon systems and so forth? The science can tell us that in the past, when we go further and further back in time, some, some of these elements of the climate system have indeed experienced tipping points, which means that we go from a gradual change to much faster change, the systems possibly tipping over. But the science today cannot sort of point out um, or point at, at which temperature rise these different possible tipping points will tip over which is a genuine uncertainty or deep uncertainty, which can only be handled today as, as a risk that we have to sort of face in one way or another. Climate change today, the global warming itself amounts to a bit more than one degree centigrade and it's global. However, it's unevenly distributed over the world. The larger changes, which are about double the global mean warming, are in the Arctic region, which is physically reasonable. Temperature rise is also faster over land than over ocean. And the land-based warming is, to date, more than one and a half degrees centigrade, whereas the ocean, ocean areas are around 0 .6, 0 0.9 degrees centigrade. And again, this is physically reasonable, understandable, considering the differences in the in land and ocean. Climate change is not only about global warming and regional warming, it's about sea level rise. It's about ocean acidification or acidification of waters because of the carbon dioxide emissions. It's about melting snow cover in the Northern hemisphere. It's about melting sea ice in the Arctic, melting parts, parts of Greenland, parts of Antarctica, melting mountain glaciers and melting permafrost. Is changes in precipitation, increases in parts of the tropics, mid-latitudes, high latitudes, and reduction in precipitation in the so-called subtropical regions between the tropics and, and mid-latitudes. For example, in the Mediterranean region here closest to us. And it's about increasing extremes, not least heat-related extremes and extreme precipitation. This is also one of the um, big things in the present report. Um, if you go back in time to previous IPCC assessments, there were research reported on that climate change is expected to change extremes such as heat waves and extreme precipitation and, and perhaps the intensity of the strongest storms. This um, graph shows not something from the future, but something that has been occurred during the past 70 years. And it shows changes in the heat related extremes, including heat waves. The graphics show a world map, sort of, uh, the North and South America to the left, Europe and Africa in the middle, and Asia, Australia, Pacific nations to the right. Red shows for the different subregions. It uh, depicts an increase in heat related extremes can be about the length, can be about the frequency, can be about the severity, how large the extreme is. And as you see, the map is red. The change is one of increase in, in these kinds of extremes. There's no blue, there's no decrease in this area, in this, uh, in this um, parameter. But there, also, but there are some regions where there's uh, too little data or the data is not showing unisonly which direction of change it might be. Um, in some regions, like for example, Central Africa or southernmost South Southern America, measurements do not go back far enough to, to make a trend assessment. One can also see there are dots in each subregion. The red arrow, by the way, points to our region here in Northeastern Europe. And the dots show the level of confidence on the attribution of these observed changes to human influence and climate. 
three dots showing that it's a high confidence, two dots says medium confidence, and one dot says low confidence, where the confidence level is affected both by the available number of data and studies, and also how whether they spread or not to some degree. Similar kind of uh, map is available on extreme precipitation where the picture is the same. Extreme precipitation is increasing in many parts of the world. There's no decrease in extreme precipitation related uh, attributes anywhere. But there are a few more regions where there's a lack of data that goes back all the way 70 years to make such a trend estimate. And there's also a depiction of drought related agricultural droughts and ecological droughts where the lack of data is even more striking, but there are signs of also increasing related extremes. Carbon budget is a central concept, has been coined a few years ago, <clears throat> and the carbon budget is the amount of cumulative carbon dioxide emission that corresponds to limiting the global mean warming to some, some degree of degrees. 1.5 degrees, for example, or the two degrees. And this comes from a lot of research in natural sciences, which points out that there's a near linear relationship between the cumulative carbon dioxide emissions, that is the sum of historical today, some possible future emissions, and the global warming, which means that to limit global warming to some temperature <clears throat> change goal requires keeping within a given carbon budget. Now, to exemplify how these carbon budgets look like, that the emissions over time until 2019 uh, accounted to 2,400 billion metric tons carbon dioxide. If you consider the 1.5 degree goal, and we say, well, um, giving all the possibilities and uncertainties that we aim at meeting the carbon dioxide goal at the probability of 50%, then from January 2020, what remained was 500 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. If we then say that 50% sounds a bit low, so let's try at least a probability of two out of three or 66%, then the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees lowers to 400 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. If we then consider the annual emissions of carbon dioxide from the use of fossil fuels, cement manufacture, and land use change are around a bit more, but let's say around 40 billion metric tons per year, it means that the remaining carbon budget, then we account for the emissions during 2020 and so far 2021 at 66% probability. Uh, the carbon budget lowers to 340, around 330 perhaps today, billion metric tons, which corresponds to a bit less than 10 years, eight to nine years of emissions at the current global level. Now the carbon budget is for carbon dioxide, but when it's, when it's calculated, uh, there are also assumptions on that other greenhouse gas emissions are also reduced, methane, nitrous oxide, and so forth. So it's not only about carbon dioxide, it's also about other greenhouse gases. It's said every once in a while, quite often, that we have just 10 years left. And it is true in the sense that we have 10 years left to really get going when it comes to redu reducing emissions. It's not about we have 10 years left to get to net zero with all the emissions. And typically when scientists look at the development pathways that could get us to 1.5 degrees centigrade, the global carbon dioxide emissions need to stop increasing, obviously, and rapidly decrease, be got by half around 2030, go to net zero by 2050, and be followed by negative emissions in order for us to save within the carbon budget. Other climate emissions need also be reduced and carbon sinks increased in order to make it all work. And of course, it is a big ask, but it's not impossible in terms of the solutions, which after all are around. In the report, there are a number of climate change scenarios. 
um, some having high climate ambition, some having small or lower climate ambition. But the two scenarios that correspond to the high ambition goals from the Paris Agreement are the so-called SSP 1-1.9, where the 1.9 is ready to forcing that temperature rise. And the other one is SSP 1-2.6. And these correspond to around 1.5 degree global goal and two degree global goal. What's important here is the SSP, because that depicts a certain socioeconomic development pathway how the world will turn out in terms of population, in terms of technology, in terms of consumption, in terms of collaboration and institutions. And there's a lot to say about this, but in, in real time, SSP1 is about the world characterized by sustainability or develop, sustainable development over time. A lot of environmental technology, reduced material consumption and so forth. This means, <clears throat> among other things, that the latest science both confirms and adds to the earlier scientific assessments. We do have a good state of knowledge. We have a robust knowledge on climate changing, that we are behind it, behind the change, uh, that it, it is important, and also how the future will respond to climate ambition or lack of. We are rapidly exhausting the carbon budgets. There are not very many years left unless the emissions start rapidly decreasing and go to net zero within a couple of decades, which underlines the asks of increased climate ambition if the Paris Agreement goals are going to be met which means global, regional, local, sectorial, and economy-wide measures to reduce emissions and increase sinks. It also underlies that climate adaptation is ever more important and risk management. For example, considering that climate extremes are already changing because of global warming, in addition to the gradual changes themselves, which also are important. The next coming IPCC reports in February, March next year about impacts, adaptation and vulnerability and mitigation of climate change will highlight even more the risks of impacts and possible measures to deal with them. Finally, just remind that climate change, which is one of the sustainable development goals is intimately linked with the other sustainable development goals. And if we think about land or climate change and land as a combined challenge, one can easily find that how we deal with climate change is important for zero hunger, energy, life on land, responsible consumption and production, but also measures to <clears throat> provide for clean energy will provide for climate change. And also take it the next year with clean water, for example, no poverty, um, again, linked to the climate change and land aspects. And one can even put sort of the next year where the connection is, is also there, even though it's perhaps sometimes less obvious. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Very many interesting uh, points and a number of things that we, we could discuss. I will just raise one question now because I, I know other people would, would really like to, to, to ask questions as well. And there are two things that I think uh, I would like to follow up on. And the f one is really this, with, there is no going back. And you talk about the, the, the melting ice and the sea level rise. And of course, those are things that have a tremendous impact on, on, on land use and how we need to think in terms of, of land use, both in Sweden, but also globally. Can you say a little bit more there? What, what do you think, like what science would be needed and how do you, we, how do you think we should as scientists sort of within agriculture and forestry uh, get ready and contribute more towards that issue? I think that in terms of land use, there should be uh, perhaps more focus on synergies and goal conflicts when it comes to managing land. Agroforestry in developing countries, for example, which can provide climate solutions, can also provide to local livelihoods and, and so forth. Nature-based solutions, restoration of ecosystems is increasingly 
um, acknowledge as the possibility to advance both climate efforts and um, biodiversity can also provide for climate adaptation. One other thing is that sort of understanding carbon sinks and inventories, considering that there's confusion between the national greenhouse gas inventories and how, how climate scientists are calculating carbon sinks and what is anthropogenic and what is natural. And also, of course, in the Swedish context, there's a part of discussion again nowadays about bioenergy and about the role of forests on, um, on providing climate solutions alongside other benefits that we do want the forest and sort of biodiversity, social and cultural values and so forth. So there's a lot for um, scientists working with land, land use of, and, and, and uh, forest agriculture to, to work. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to you in the, in the open discussion in a while. And now I would like to, to welcome um, Professor Solomon Hook to, to, give, to give your presentation. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and thank you to SLU for inviting me. Let me start by apologizing for not having a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to talk. I, I hope that won't be too boring for you. And let me start by giving a, a, a bit more of an uh, introduction to myself and my work. And I, I'm going to uh, state it in terms of three different hats that I have uh, worn over the years. The first one, picking up on Marku's excellent presentation on the IPCC, is my role in the IPCC. I have had the privilege of being a lead author uh, of the third assessment report in working group two on adaptation, which is my area of uh, research. And then in the fourth assessment report, I became a coordinating lead author on the chapter uh, in working group two that looked at both adaptation and mitigation together, something that had not been done before. And then in the fourth, fifth assessment report, I was the coordinating lead author of uh, chapter 14 of working group two, which was one of four chapters on adaptation. So adaptation over the years has become a bigger and bigger scientific uh, area of uh, research publications and therefore part of the assessment of the IPCC. And now adaptation to climate change is a very, very big part of um, the IPCC. I have not uh, been a lead author in the sixth assessment report because I feel it's time for the younger generation uh, to take part, uh, but I will reflect a little bit about my experience in the IPCC. The second hat that I wear is in the uh, policy making at the global level in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I am one of the very few people who have actually attended every single conference of parties over the last 26 years. I've been to all the way from number one to number 25. But I'm, I don't go to them as a negotiator. I'm an academic, I'm a researcher. Uh, I go as an independent uh, observer, but I do have a role in the negotiations as an advisor to the group of least developed countries. This is a formal caucus group uh, within the developing countries, non-annex one, uh, larger group, currently 47 countries chaired by Bhutan. And I have been advising them for many years now on the topic of adaptation, and now more recently on an emerging topic of loss and damage, which I will also speak about. And then my third hat is my day job. I am a, a professor in the Independent University of Bangladesh based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I also had a, a, a research institution called the International Center for Climate Change and Development based at that university. Our focus of work is primarily working on adaptation, but within adaptation, primarily working on adaptation of the most vulnerable communities living in the most vulnerable countries, not just Bangladesh, but we are based in Bangladesh, but also in the region, in South Asia, in Asia, and across the least developed countries, most of which are in Africa. So a long uh, history of working on the ground on adaptation to climate change, which I'd like to share 
a few thoughts with you as well. So let me start with my first hat. Uh, I have been an IPCC uh, lead author for many, many years. I have a, a, a very good understanding of how the IPCC works and, and runs. And uh, I, I very much appreciated the presentation made by Marku just now. I'll start with my uh, take on the IPCC six assessment report, working group one that came out on the 9th of August. In my view, this particular report and the date 9th of August, 2021 is in itself a tipping point because it is the first time in 30 years that the IPCC working group one, uh, by the way, working group one is a much more conservative group of scientists than working group two, which I belong to. We are, you know, lots of social scientists. We have lots of opinions and lots of arguments. The, the hardcore scientists are very conservative scientists and they do not like to step out of their comfort zone in making assertions, uh, uh, don't put their head above the parapet. But this time they did. The very first time the IPCC Working Group 1 has said, they have seen, not predicted, seen unequivocal evidence of human-induced climate change causing impacts. Now they are attributable to the fact that we have raised global temperature above one degree because of emissions of greenhouse gases since the industrial revolution. Attributable. This attribution science, as Marku just pointed out, is a big breakthrough. In the past, we were not able to do, or they were not able to do attribution as quickly. They said, yes, you know, floods will be bigger, cyclones will be more, but we can't say if this flood was because of climate change or that cyclone was because of climate change. Now they can. They can't say it happened because of climate change. They can say it got worse because of climate change. It became more intense because of climate change. It became much more damaging because of loss and damage, uh, because of climate change. And therefore, I believe, and this is my characterization of the uh, Working Group One uh, report on the 9th of August, 2021, is it heralds a new era. I call it the era of loss and damage from human induced climate change. Not something that's going to happen in the future anymore. It is already happening. The floods you saw in Europe, in Germany that killed nearly 200 Germans, the Hurricane Ida that hit the United States and killed about 50 people from the floods in New York and flooded the New York subways. These are all human induced climate change impacts and they're going to get worse. Every day somewhere in the world, a, a extreme weather event is going to be broken and that intensity of that weather event can be attributed, not 100%, but not 0% either, to the fact that global temperature has risen more than one degree above uh, uh, pre-industrial already. 1.1, uh, 1.2, you know, we don't know exactly how much, and it, it varies by the location on the globe. The polar regions are different from the tropical regions, but nevertheless, more than one degree centigrade since pre-industrial, is now causing human-induced climate change, particularly weather extremes. Also, long-term slow events like sea level rise, etc. So, very important scientific point to make. We have passed a threshold. We are going into this new era. Uh, I would like to also share a few observations about the IPCC itself. In my view, the IPCC and I've had the privilege of being involved in it for many, many years, is one of the best, in fact, in fact, I would say even the best global scientific collaboration that the, you know, the planet has been able to do, the countries of the, the on earth have been able to do collectively. It involves all the countries of the world. It involves scientists from different disciplines, from developed and developing countries. And it uh, adds to the body of global knowledge on the science of climate change uh, very, very effectively and provides guidance and advice to policymakers at the same time. It's an extremely credible, extremely uh, well-organized, extremely uh, um, you know, useful uh, aggregation of scientific knowledge uh, over the years. And therefore, a great, great enterprise in my view. However, I would like to point out a few lacunae or gaps that remain. One of them is representation 
of science. And uh, Marku in his presentation showed us these uh, uh, characterist, characterized uh, um, uh, global maps with the different hexagons representing different regions. And he showed you a few uh, of those uh, hexagons which were blank. There was not enough data in the middle of Africa, in the south of South America. Now, that represents a lack of science in those regions. And so the global uh, database, global scientific information is not a level playing field. There is much more uh, data coming out of the developed world and much less data coming out of the developing world and less, much less uh, formal science being done in the developing world that contributes. So it has improved over time. In fact, one of my biggest efforts while I was in the IPCC has been to ensure that um, in, in, uh, participation from uh, younger scientists, particularly from the developing countries, is encouraged and enhanced. And I'm very pleased to have uh, brought in a lot of uh, younger scientists from developing countries into the IPCC, but it's still not a level playing field. The, uh, the South in generally, the uh, global South, but in particular, the most vulnerable countries in the global South, I call them the deep South, uh, is very underrepresented still in the IPCC process. And I hope that the IPCC, when it starts its seventh cycle, uh, uh, looks to in, in enhancing uh, or leveling that playing field. The second uh, issue that I want to bring up is on the policy making at the global level. Uh, the IPCC has been very influential in, in uh, supporting uh, actions at the global level, the Paris Agreement, uh, the UNFCC itself came out of the first assessment report, the Kyoto Protocol came out of the second assessment report, uh, the Marrakesh Accords came out of the third assessment report, and then uh, and so on with the Paris Agreement and now with COP26 coming up. So we hope that the IPCC report will be very influential in decision making in uh, COP26, and in particular, as I mentioned, the issue of loss and damage from climate change, which is a new phenomena that the IPCC has identified that needs to be taken much more seriously in the global uh, uh, um, decision making in COP. And then my final and third area is uh, from my perspective, my day job in Bangladesh, where I work on climate change adaptation, particularly with the most vulnerable countries, uh, com uh, communities in the most vulnerable countries, including my country, Bangladesh, we work on what we call locally led adaptation or what used to be called community based adaptation, where we uh, try to identify the most vulnerable communities. But more than that, we then spend time finding out how we can help them to adapt and I would say Bangladesh is going up a learning curve on adaptation to climate change, where we are learning very, very fast and we can share that knowledge with other developing countries. Indeed, we can share that knowledge even with developing countries, developed countries like Sweden. So let me um, end my uh, uh, presentation here and I'd be very happy to uh, answer questions later with the proposition that Bangladesh is a uh, a very vulnerable country. We are, you know, 100, for those of you who don't know Bangladesh, it's 170 million people living in less than 150,000 square kilometers with a population density of more than 1,000 per square kilometer on, located on the, uh, the delta of two of the world's biggest rivers, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, a, a, a very poor country. We're a least developed country, but we are trying to graduate out of least developed country status. Uh, we are regularly hit by floods, regularly hit by cyclones. In any global ranking of, of vulnerability, Bangladesh comes usually one, two or three in a global ranking, uh, depending on what the weights of the different uh, items are. So very vulnerable country, but that isn't the story. The story is we are vulnerable, but we are learning how to cope with vulnerability and how to adapt and become more resilient. And so Bangladesh, uh, in, in the categorization that uh, I heard at the beginning uh, uh, of this uh, talk by uh, uh, the intro introduction of your uh, SLU uh, collaboration with low-income countries, I would say Bangladesh is certainly a low-income country, but it's also a high-knowledge country. It's not a low knowledge country. And so we would like to offer ways in which we might be able to share our knowledge with Sweden, with academics and researchers in Sweden, at the LS, SLU and other universities, and see whether we can collaborate towards uh, at solving or at least dealing with this global challenge of climate change 
that is going to affect all countries. Indeed, it's already affecting all countries, whether you're rich or poor, everybody's going to be affected and we all need to be working together, particularly in the scientific community to uh, help each other, share knowledge with each other and uh, solve this global problem together. I'll stop there, thank you. Mm. Thank you very, thank you so much um, for, for your presentation. And you, you responded to many of the, the questions we, we have been preparing. Just, a, it's not a short question. Yeah, it's a, a question that needs a, a short answer due to time. So you said that you are working in the, in the group with the least developed countries, which I fully agree, they are not the least developed. It's, it's low income countries. Which, which a lot of, of potential knowledge and so on. So what will be, if you just make it very short, the key thing that you will drive in the Glasgow meeting? What is really sort of the, the most important thing for that group of countries to put forward in the Glasgow meeting? Well, uh, obviously the most important is to stay uh, below 1.5 degrees. It's slipping away as we just heard from Marco, but it's still possible because that is critical. That was our demand in Paris. We got it in the Paris Agreement and we want that to be implemented. Unfortunately, we're not uh, implementing it fast enough. The second one is money. Uh, there was a promise made in Paris by the rich countries to provide uh, finance to the tune of $100 billion a year starting last year, in fact, 2020. That hasn't been delivered. And even what has been delivered has been primarily for mitigation activities and very little for adaptation, which is what we need. So we need funding for adaptation. We've asked for half the money should come for adaptation. These are our two ongoing demands. And then the third new demand is we need to discuss loss and damage from climate change because that is now a reality, as I said, based on the IPCC third assessment report. Thank you so much, um, Professor Hark. And I'm sure we will come back again to those things in the, in the open discussion. So now it's time for a two minute leg stretcher. So just two minutes. Uh, so you just put off your camera and, and walk around and then we will start in, in two minutes again. Thank you. Welcome back everybody. Two minutes is very short, but I hope you at least have had time to, to stand up a bit and so that you feel refreshed for the, for the next of our interesting webinar. So now I would like to welcome um, Professor Christina Benno uh, to give her presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have been giving the title Urban uh, Landscapes in Transition or Landscapes in Transition from Risk Assessment to Guidelines for Effective Communication across disciplines to meet challenges and move forward. Uh, the outline of my talk is like this. First, I'd like to say a few words of what I mean by a landscape approach. And then I want to give some examples of how we can use a landscape approach to identify drivers of climate change adaptation and mitigation decision making. Uh, and how that knowledge gained can be used to identify communication needs and to develop evidence based guidelines on effective communications on climate change adaptation and mitigation. Well, we heard about the, the cloud bursts, bursts and flooding events of Germany and Bangladesh, of course, as well. Uh, but we actually had one event in Sweden uh, not so long ago in August this year. We had uh, a lot of, of rain coming down in the Gävle region. Maybe you remember some of you this occasion. Do you know this person, by the way? No? Well, um, do you think he has taken measures to adapt to climate change? It's a tricky question. Difficult to answer, perhaps. Would it help if I told you how much money he has? 
would it help if I told you how many organizations he belongs to? Would it help if I told you where he lives? Climate change has impacts and those impacts, they occur in the landscape, in the landscape where we are, where we live, where we work, which is the, the space that we, where, where we inhabit the world. So those impacts, they can lead to reasons for mitigation and adaptation decision making. And for that to happen, we need a capacity to respond. And uh, in the mainstream literature, that capacity to respond is described as depending on monetary wealth, institutions, uh, technology, and that kind of, of uh, structures in the society. But our research, but also and also other researchers, research has focused increasingly on the roles of the individuals, uh, and actually, decision making in response to climate change requires a strong belief in the local impacts of climate change, and that belief can be fortified by experiences of climate change, if that person believes that the causes of the event that he or she has experienced can be attributed to climate change. Now, this kind of subjective attribution to climate change, of, of causes to climate change, is in fact very important. These graphs show the results from data collected among citizens of Malmö, which is a city in Sweden. Uh, and you can see that experience of climate change is linked to the probability of adaptation. So if you believe strongly that you have experienced the negative impacts of climate change, it's more likely that you have taken measures for adaptation. If you believe that you have experienced the positive impacts of climate change, because there are also positive impacts of climate change in some places uh, now and then. That is also something that increases the probability of adaptation. When it comes to mitigation uh, decisions, those are also promoted by a strong belief in negative, having experienced negative impacts of climate change. But when it comes to positive experiences, we can see that if you strongly believe that you have uh, experienced the positive consequences of climate change, that exactly that actually inhibits decisions for mitigation. So the personal level matters. And this is an example from a study we made in southern Sweden. It's the municipality of Höganäs, and uh, the study is about rising sea level. And what we did was to compare uh, the, the beliefs of those living in Höganäs, people living in Höganäs, and people living in Jonstorp. And we found that that uh, people living in Jonstorp are actually more, more strongly attributed the causes of events to climate change than people living in, in Höganäs. And if you have a look at the coastline in Höganäs, it's fairly flat. In Jonstorp, we have flat areas, but we have also a cliff coast like this one, which has been eroded recently. Uh, and this erosion takes place all along. So it's very visible to people. And it seems that people have more strongly attributed uh, situations where we have high, uh, high water level and the consequences of erosion to climate change than people in Höganäs because it's not as visible to them. So this means that people living in Jonstorp actually have, they have a higher preparedness to take measures to adapt to climate change than those living in Höganäs. And probably then they also accept policies and uh, 
adaptation policies more e easily than people living in Hagen. Uh, but also in the case where people do believe that in the local impacts of climate change, and they do attribute the causes of events to climate change, we still see a variation in, in adaptation. This is a study of, of a across Europe among forest professionals. And we can see that the, the percentage of forest professionals who have uh, taken measures in favor of adaptation to climate change varies across, across Europe, even though the majority believes in these factors. So what we found was that people living in uh, sorry, forest professionals in Finland and in Bulgaria, Bulgaria, they had a weaker belief or were uncertain about local impacts of climate change to the forest. So they, mean, they need communications on climate change per se and the impacts on the forest. The countries in yellow here, the northern countries here, they less strongly believe that they had experienced the, the impacts of climate change. So they need communications that fortifies their beliefs that, that they have experienced the impacts of climate change. And this is in comparison to the southern countries here. Now, if we have a measure of how negative people expect the impact of climate change to be uh, and how or how positive they expect they, the net impacts to be. We can see here that people in Portugal, they have, and I say people, I mean forest professionals, have a very negative expectations uh, from climate change. Whereas in the north, northeast, the expectations are much more positive, and in particular, when it comes to gradual impacts of climate change. This is the sudden impacts of climate change. But Portugal stands out in both of these uh, situations that they have a very negative expectation about the climate change. And if we compare this to the map of where adaptation is taking place, we can see that Portugal actually has a very low rate of adaptation, but still they expect very negative things to happen. Uh, and this is what we call tipping point behavior, that to these people, the, the earth system or the relevant parts of the earth system has passed a tipping point so that there is actually no use in them for them to take measures to adapt, because it will not make any difference. Uh, and the opposite was then occurred for, for Finnish forest professionals. Uh, opposite in terms of that it's positive uh, tipping point behavior. Uh, this means actually that communications on the consequences of climate change can both inhibit and promote adaptation to climate change, depending on the person you, you speak to. Uh, so the human aspects of, of, of uh, adaptation and, and is very important. So I would like to conclude by saying that landscape analysis, both with analysis and assessments of the biogeophysical aspects and the beliefs and expectations of the individuals, can bridge the science practice gap by identification of drivers and strategies of decision making. And that can be used to identify communication needs. And those communication needs, they can be used for evidence-based guidelines on effective climate change policies, including communications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for this very uh, interesting and eye-opening talk. We will come back to you with, with the question in the open discussions. So thank you for now. And I would like to give the floor to Eric Carlton. Christina, can you please take down your sharing? Oh. 
Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change and land use perspectives, and I'm going to utilize uh, some data from the Swedish forest carbon sink, and then I'm going to end up in Ethiopia. Uh, and use the charcoal production there as an example. So it will be a bit of a journey. Uh, if we start with the Swedish climate reporting and the Swedish uh, uh, carbon sink in land use, uh, if you look at the upper panel here, we can see how much emissions we have from various sectors that are part of the Swedish greenhouse gas reporting. And uh, we see that energy is uh, one of the biggest uh, emitters. Uh, industry is much less, but then we have to take into account that some of the industry energy use is found in the first bar here. Agriculture is also around six or seven megaton uh, carbon dioxide per year. And then we have a small emission from the base sector. If we add up all this in this bar, we get around 50 megaton carbon dioxide, which is normally referred to as the Swedish uh, emissions. But we have also an uptake in uh, the land use, which is quite considerable. Uh, it is uh, here around more than 35 megaton of carbon dioxide. And if we subtract this from the Swedish emissions, we get a rather modest total emission from the Swedish society. Uh, this is not the whole truth. We have natural fluxes of carbon dioxide that are not part of, of this uh, reporting or so. But in general, Sweden uh, emits relatively little uh, greenhouse gases when you take the land use sink into account. And effectively, it, it balances out around 70% of of the anthropogenic greenhouse gas em emissions from all other sectors. Uh, this has never, it has never been sort of the policy in Sweden to really try to take this into account in, in, uh, in the greenhouse gas negotiations in the climate negotiations or so. And, and the policy have been that Sweden should reduce its greenhouse gases without uh, uh, utilizing the sink in any large to any large extent. It's also not allowed according to the to, to the uh, rules in the Kyoto Protocol and, and uh, the, about how we account for for greenhouse gases. Uh, the forestry is by far the dominating part of this land use sink. And we can divide in the, according to the Kyoto Protocol, it divide, it is divided and we report afforestation, deforestation, and then forest management. And we can see that we have a very small afforestation. We are not really increasing the, the forested land very much. We have uh, a little bit higher deforestation. This is forest that is removed to make uh, uh, roads, uh, new build, new uh, residential areas, et cetera, et cetera. So there, we are losing forest land and we are losing carbon from that land. And then we have sort of the managed forest and we have a big sink in biomass we have uh, a sink in soil carbon, which is here, and we have a sink in harvested wood products. I'm going to come back to that later. But we have also emissions here, and these emissions are from drained uh, peatland soils. 
as I said, we're only allowed to utilize a very small part of this sink, less than 5% or two and a half megaton of carbon dioxide uh, in our so that counting toward our commitments of emission reduction. Uh, we have also uh, uh, the accounting system also requires Sweden to maintain a sink of at least 41 megaton of carbon dioxide. And if we don't do that, we have to account for all emissions uh, above that. So we have to maintain this sink. Uh, there has already been questions in the, uh, in the chat about uh, how uh, emissions from bioenergy are counted. Uh, the principle we have when we do uh, measure changes in carbon stock in the forest and in other land uses is that we use permanent sampling plots. And we come back to these sampling plots with a regular interval and measure the carbon stocks. And then the difference between the carbon stocks f from one year to another, from one inventory to another, becomes the change. Uh, uh, is the change in carbon stock. And we follow all the different carbon pools. So we follow the biomass, we follow the dead wood, we follow litter and soil carbon. Everything that comes out from the forest here is regarded as an emission. So every tree that is cut and leave the forest ends up becoming emission of carbon dioxide. This is why uh, biogenic emissions are not reported in the energy sector, because they are reported already in the land use sector when we remove harvest from forest, it become carbon dioxide and is accounted in the land use and land use chain sector. If we were to report it in the energy sector, it will be double counting of emissions, which is, uh, uh, which we, which is not really uh, acceptable. Uh, a small part of the products here we bring back into the reporting system by following the harvested wood products pool. But it's only about 50% of, of what goes to timber and paper pulp production that ends up in this pool. The other, uh, most of the other remains become also bioenergy. Uh, The climate impact of forest uh, is positive uh, when carbon pools in the forest are increasing. And we can see in this diagram how uh, Swedish forestry, uh, the results from the Swedish uh, forest inventory. Uh, the upper line here is the growth in million cubic meters. The, this line here is the harvest, and this is the natural mortality. And if we add the natural mortality to the harvest, it's still much less than the growth. And this is the uh, explanation to the big sink in forest biomass. So to forest to be a sink, we need to increase the carbon pools in the forest. Uh, we can also- Before, Eric, you need to be a bit aware of time because you have like, okay. been talking for 10 minutes. So yeah, so two minutes to like wind up. Okay. Uh, so when the forests are established, we also bind carbon and uh, we also reduce the climate impact when we, substitute for fossil fuels. So you see the panel here down to the right. Uh, 
the Swedish forest thing is uh, under strong debate. Uh, one can look at it as successful natural resource management because we harvest, we build up our stock of forest for the future, or as somebody said, one of the greatest lies of our time. Uh, we are the second, third largest exporter of forest products in the world. We have had a policy to protect forestry and develop forestry since the 1900s. And we also have a large proportion of private forest owner with a long time term perspective of forestry. Uh, the sector is under strong debate. And also that it has further potential management from a production perspective is far from optimal. Forest products are, are also traded on an open global market. So if we don't cut, forest will be cut somewhere else. Uh, we need also to look at the global demand for forest products. Uh, the population is increasing following the same trajectory as uh, global uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, we need to build 30,000 homes every day for the coming 80 years just to cope with population in increase. And further, as Marco was uh, mentioning, uh, we also need to fulfill a lot of other sustainable development goals. Many of the least developed countries are in a situation where Sweden was in the early 1900s. There is a lot, quite a lot of land that can be potentially forested and forestry is emerging in response to local markets. So, uh, here, uh, uh, Eric, do you, yeah, we would like need to. It's just uh, one minute left. Okay. So here is an example, for example, of acacia decurrence cultivation that are used for uh, charcoal production, and we can see how. You do you have to change the slide, Eric? Uh, I am changing the slide. Okay. We can see how. This is affecting both the cultivation landscape, but also the natural forest. So the natural forest is coming back when people have access to biomass produced by uh, these plantations. And the production of charcoal here has a big economic impact. It's essentially lifting people out of poverty and they talk about poverty in the past tense when we interview them. So the question I would like to put forward for discussion is, so how the need for climate and economic benefits of forest production should be reconciled with the strong ambition for conservation in Sweden and in low income countries. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you very much to, to, all, to all speakers. Um, so now we have uh, 12 minutes for, for an open discussion, and I've seen very many questions in the questions and answer box. So I suggest, Hanna, that you select one or more of them to start with. Thank you, Ingrid. I would start just with one of them saying uh, to you as a lead authors, what, what are your views on leading politicians' response to the report? Do you believe their climate action will be more radical because of this report? So, so this was to Salomon and Marco. I... As a lead, to, to the lead authors, yeah. So I think uh, yes. both Salomon and Marco. and Marco, perhaps. So who would like to let, start? Let, let me uh, jump in and then uh, Marco uh, can come as well. Uh, so uh, this is a very good question and something that I uh, grapple with a lot um, because in the developing countries by and large, um, science as an input or scientific evidence as an input into decision-making 
is actually quite low. It isn't something that happens routinely. Um, decision makers, politicians, either national politicians or you know ministers of finance, don't really listen to scientists on a routine basis to make their decisions. They listen to many other groups, but not necessarily scientists. So one of the challenges that scientists like myself who live and work in developing countries is how do we uh, get our message to the decision makers in a manner that can inform their decisions, not tell them what to do, but tell them the consequences of different actions that they can, uh, that they will have to take. And it's not easy, but it is very possible to do. And I would say the IPCC uh, plays a very, very important role. So, you know, I, as an individual scientist in Bangladesh, can say one thing, a politician may listen to me or not listen to me. But when I am able to say, this is the view of the global scientific community given by the IPCC, then that elevates the message. It's something that they need to listen to. Whether they take it into account in decision-making is a second order problem, but at least they listen to it well when it comes from the IPCC. And I think that's one of the biggest um, pro positive of the IPCC. It, it provides global high level scientific input to decision makers, both at the global level, but also at the national level in every country in the world, some more, some less, but every country is able to take uh, the messages from the IPCC. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. And Marco, do you have any comments to this question? Well, I can um, just agree. It is so that that was mentioned that the IPCC is a very good vehicle of providing scientific input into different processes. And the IPCC report that now came out will be highlighted also in Glasgow in, in, in the various events and I'm sure it will be referred to in, in many of the discussions. And the same will apply, of course, in the next coming reports that they will even impact. Just an example that the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree global warming in 2018, that my feeling is that it sort of made 1.5 degree the goal that is discussed in all arenas. Nobody's talking about the two degree goal anywhere, um, even though it's also in the Paris Agreement as the goal. So um, there is an impact from, from science as well. Thanks. Thank you. And I would like to put a question to, to you, Christina. You uh, very clearly show that communication has um, an important role for, for adaptation and for how people sort of behave. Can you sort of uh, bring that uh, some steps further? So what would it mean so for, for how we should communicate as scientists and also like as, as a country. So what, do, what are the implications of what you have found in your research? Well, I have found, first of all, as you mentioned, it's, it's crucially important uh, what people believe and expect for the future from climate change. Uh, and we need actually to investigate that. We need evidence to, to um, inform the design of communications, because we live in a world where we, we are sort of drowned in information coming all, all the time. Uh, and uh, just as in a teaching situation, uh, we need to, to adjust the content of the communications to the audience. And to be able to do that, we need actually to, we need to scientifically uh, examine or uh, do research on who needs what. Thank you very much. Um, Hanna? Yes. Um... I would lift up the question is, uh, as we have entered the area era of loss and damage, what are the implications for legal actions and how might these increase the pace of greenhouse gas emission reduction? So I guess this one is directed to Selimul Hook as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you to the questioner for that uh, uh, excellent question. So uh, for those of you who follow the uh, international negotiations on climate change, uh, over the years, we'll know that the topic of loss and damage is a highly politically sensitive issue. Um, in fact, the very phrase loss and damage 
is a, a euphemism to refer to liability and compensation, which are taboo words. We are not allowed to use the words liability and compensation in the UNFCC because some of the rich countries, particularly the United States, does not allow us to use those words. You know, it's highly politically contentious. And so we use loss and damage as a, as a uh, formulation uh, of that issue of uh, liability and compensation. In fact, in the Paris Agreement that was agreed in COP21, we have an article on, on loss and damage. We have agreed to take, take this issue seriously. And in that article, in order to get that article approved in the Paris Agreement at the very end, in the last few minutes of the Paris Agreement, it was only agreed by the United States in particular, in fact, by um, then Secretary of State John Kerry, who is now the climate envoy of President Biden at that time, he was the Secretary of State of uh, President Obama. He insisted on inserting language in the COP21 decision that said, they, even though this article is on loss and damage, it cannot be used for liability and compensation. That's a very unusual thing to put into an agreement is, what is this agreement not about? <laughs> it, it doesn't say, what is this agreement about? It said, this agreement cannot be used for liability and compensation. And we had to accept it in order to get Article 8 on loss and damage accepted. And so we have accepted, the developing countries by and large, in the negotiations, we are not going to use the terms liability and compensation. Uh, we are saying solidarity. We are saying uh, the developed countries, particularly the high, high polluting countries, should take some sense of responsibility to help the poor victims of climate change around the world. We saw, for example, in Germany, when they had the flash floods, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel went to visit the victims. Um, as I said, nearly 200, mil 200 people died in Germany which is something that doesn't happen in Bangladesh, by the way. We evacuate millions of people successfully. Uh, they don't die anymore from floods and cyclones in Bangladesh. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, she immediately found out of thin air, the federal government had 300 million euros compensation to German victims of loss and damage from climate change. And that's the right thing to do. It's absolutely correct thing to do for her. But then what about the rest of the world? What about victims in Bangladesh and in Africa? Uh, is Germany not going to give anything to them? Is it going to only give compensation to its own citizens? And that I think is a moral issue that the leaders of the, the rich world have to come up with. We don't need to talk about liability compensation. One last point, the fact that the UN Framework Convention does not talk about liability and compensation does not mean that word disappears. That is taking place under legal uh, cases that are taking place under national jurisdictions in a number of countries. There are cases in Germany. There are many cases in the United States, many cases by children against their own governments for not protecting them. So this is not going to go away. It's going to happen. And it may even happen at the global level with a case going from Vanuatu to the International Court of Justice, which will ask for a legal uh, deficient because loss and damage is actually a legal issue. It's not a negotiating issue as much as it is a le legal issue. Anyway, those are the, the situation as of now, but watch this space. This problem is not going to go away. This problem is going to get bigger and bigger. And unless we address this problem early and try and solve it, it's going to become a crisis when it becomes insoluble. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now a question to Eric Carlton. So what are the most pressing challenges that future agriculture and forestry has to deal with in different parts of the world? So it's a big question, but maybe you can give some examples. And I wanted to bring in like agriculture as well, because you, you showed agriculture as sort of a source, a forestry both as a source and a sink. So can you sort of develop a little bit how what you see needs to happen in in those land uses. In are, you, are you talking about pressing changes in terms of uh, sort of climate adaptation or? Uh... Yeah, yes, adaptation, but possibilities for mitigation. So, so more in relation to your graphs with the greenhouse gas emissions, you know, that, that you had. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that uh, uh, there is quite a lot of potential for climate mitigation in the land use sector, uh, especially, especially related to forestry, of course, since agriculture 
uh, doesn't uh, really uh, accum build large carbon stocks since we have normally an annual or, or turnover, but uh, we can combine forestry and agriculture such in agroforestry systems. And uh, we can also, also if we uh, cultivate efficiently on the agriculture land, we can have more land for forestry, which can accumulate carbon, and we can utilize the income from, from, from the forest in order to produce also more efficiently in the agriculture. Uh, then, uh, if we want to get rid of the emissions in the agriculture sector, they are uh, associated a lot with uh, the keeping of animals. So, of course, if we have a more plant-based diet, we can reduce that. But having that in mind, I would also say that a lot of that, uh, uh, that uh, the land uh, that we use, for example, for grazing of animals is not really uh, easy to utilize for, for, for plant production plant production always. And thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to everybody who has been putting questions and thank you to the, to the speakers. As you all are aware, we could, there are so many important things to discuss. So I feel this is just the beginning. And this is one of the, the, of the climate communications or climate uh, discussions that are organized by the SLU Future Platforms. So thank you very much. And I will hand over to, to Nina uh, Fogel for the next step. Thank you, Ingrid. And I can just echo again what you all said, like the audience is in the chat and you just said it, Ingrid. Thank you to all of you, in particular, certainly to our keynote speakers, Marco Rumukainen, Salimul Huk, Christina Blenov and Erik Kaltun, really for sharing your insightful perspectives and expertise. And um, further, certainly thank you to you, Ingrid, for guiding us through this wide field, as you just said, and um, highlighting in particular questions. And to our audience for your engagement, interest, and certainly our, your questions. And we couldn't cover all of them, but we will take them with us as insightful and important references and directions to continue this climate conversation, as we call the seminar series. Um, so please, if you want to see further information or information on our next events, so please um, take a look at lsu.se slash climate conversations and more information also can follow later on. Um, so now we hope, first of all, you appreciated this webinar and that we will see you also at our digital, digital mingle um, following right after this um, webinar at WonderMe wonder.me. You find more information in the chat. And in case you have questions, um, Emily will stay here at um, Zoom to guide you in case that is necessary. However, please be aware you have to leave Zoom and close down the program to enter wonder.me. So again, big thank you to our speakers, to all of you being present here. And I hope to see you in the next conversation. Um, and to critically yeah, debate and access our ways forward. Thank you from my end.